Alrighty, well I have started the recording for today's webinar. Um, if you have not been on one of our webinars for the Every Child Ready to Read project before, uh, Sue McLeaf Nespeka is our presenter today. Uh, she's been working with us for the past, oh, about six months now. And we welcome her this afternoon to talk about early literacy tips for story times, specifically focusing on our twos and threes in our audience. So I'm going to go ahead and turn over the presentation to Sue, and I'll be monitoring the chat as we go along. So welcome this afternoon, and we'll see what Sue has to say. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Okay, we did. I have already gone through the early early literacy tips for story times for babies up to two. If you were not able to attend that webinar, my understanding is it's recorded and you can listen to it. In fact, I think some people have already done that. This one will also be recorded, so um, you can listen to tell others to listen to it if they want. And just a reminder: the last one, uh, there was a little confusion there on the date uh, and day of the week, etc. The last one, which will be early literacy tips for story times for the fours and fives, is November 10th, also at 2 o'clock, and it's a Thursday. I think someplace it said Tuesday, November 10th, or there was some other type of information, but it is Thursday, November 10th at 2, and that's for the fours and fives. And of course, you'll all be, um, <laughs> you'll all be right in the midst of story times at that point. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm not sure how many of you actually attended the baby one. Uh, we're going to follow the same pattern. This is my email address if anyone wants to email me later with questions or whatever. What we're going to do, like I did in the baby one, uh, we know from the Every Child Ready to Read project that there are five practices that we are hoping to encourage parents and early childhood educators to do with these young children ages zero up to five. And those five practices are talk, sing, read, write, and play. But as I pointed out in the last webinar, you know, to tell a parent, well, you need to talk to your child or you need to sing to your child, many, many of them will say, well, I already talk to my child or I already sing with my child or I already read to my child. So what I'm trying to do here today and in these three webinars is to give clues to parents and early childhood people, whoever is either living with or working with these uh, young kids, ways that we need to talk with the child, ways we need to sing. So, so there are tips that go along. So it's not just so simple talk, sing, read, write, and play, write and play, but actually there are some tips that go along with each one of those. So we're going to start out with the talking. So when we look at the children who are ages two and three in story times, and when we think about talking, uh, what you might want to do, or what I would recommend, is maybe share a story and then retell it again, but the second time through, see if the kids can supply the rhyming words. Now, a couple things here. A lot of you will think, why would I read the same book twice in a story time? Well, granted, we don't normally do that, but what I'm saying is there's, <laughs> there's no story time police out there that are going to fine you for reading the same book twice. And actually, in this particular case, it's really going to help children. Maybe you share the book and say, you know, I'm going to read that again. Let's see if you can help me tell it this time. Now, obviously the twos, if I know a lot of you have already done story times for twos, and a lot of them will just, even if they know the answer, they'll just kind of sit there and stare at you or look at you. <laughs> so they might not be the most vocal. I think some of the threes will be. But, you know, you can try it, and I'm sure that the parents in the room will help a little bit too. So, you know, we want to try to get them to to do this. So the book I'm going to show next is an old classic. Um, I actually had Deborah as a speaker one time. <laughs> this is really the only book that she ever wrote that got published, but here it is, a classic. I think I'd be thrilled if I just even wrote one book that got published that was a classic. So this is how this book goes, or the story goes. I'm sure a lot of you know it. Is your mama a llama? I ask my friend Dave. No, she's not, is the answer Dave gave. She hangs by her feet, and she lives in a cave. I don't believe that's how llamas behave. Oh, I said, you're right about that. I think your mama sounds more like a... And when you turn to the next page, you can see a picture. It's going to be a bat. So maybe the first time through, I, I present it that way, turn the page, they can see the bat. 
And then I do it a second time, and this time I pause and see if they can supply the rhyming word. Another thing you might consider doing is telling one story in several different ways and then have the children join in. Now, I want to point out a book right now. It's by Betsy Diamant Cohen. She's very well known for her uh, Mother Goose programs that she's done all throughout the U.S. But she has a book called Transforming Preschool Storytime, and it's very interesting. Whether you agree with the theory or not, it's certainly an interesting book to look at. And what, is she, what she's basing this on um, is research that is out there. <clears throat> I mean, I've read the research myself. But it talks about connections in the brain and how one book um, that is the same book presented in a number of consecutive story times but presented in a different way can really help with brain development. It has to do with multiple intelligence, multiple intelligences through repetition. So what she advocates in this book is read this, read the story and then maybe you read it one week and then the next week you act it out and then the third week the same book you sing it. Well, I think that's fine, but I don't even know why we can't do that within one individual story time. And that's what I'm going to recommend next. Let's say we read the book Five Little Ducks, this particular edition by Child's Play. And I mentioned in the last webinar that they do have some really good books. We used to think of them as a company that just sold toys. It was kind of like Tupperware. You sold Child's Play things in your homes or whatever. But they have some really good books. So this is a Five Little Ducks. This is a, and it doesn't come in hardback, I don't think. It's just a, like a paperback book. But it has the CD, CD with it. So let's say you read that, and then you play the song. So that would be a second way. Um, and maybe you only want to do two, or maybe three. But let's say uh, maybe you read the book and then also sing the song while you're doing, you know, a flannel board version. And so they can help, you know, how many ducks are left or, you know, they can join in here or there. Or here's a chart of the five little ducks. Maybe we can um, point to the numbers. Five, now there's four ducks left or three ducks left. So again, the idea being that you present the story maybe more than once, present it in a different way. This helps with brain development and then have them join in. That's the talking again. Have them join in in one of the versions. We can also have children repeat repetitious words or phrases in a book. For an example, I love this story down on the farm. It was illustrated by Will Hillenbrand. Uh, listen to the repetition in it if you do not know the book. Sun comes up, kid wakes up, down on the farm, down on the farm. Rooster shoe, cock-a-doodle-doo, down on the farm, down on the farm. Crows peck straw, call, 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 down on the farm, down on the farm. Horses say, nay, 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 down on the farm, down on the farm. So obviously what they'd be joining in is that repetitious phrase, down on the farm. Here's one I know you all know, The Napping House by Audrey and Don Wood. Um, the repetitious phrase here that they can... Uh, join in is where everyone is sleeping. There is a house, a napping house, where everyone is sleeping. And in that house, there is a bed, a cozy bed, in a napping house, where everyone is sleeping. So the repetitious phrase is where everyone is sleeping. Now, if that's a little bit much for some of your two-year-olds, you could also just put your hands like under your head, like kind of in a sleepy position. Maybe they just join in in the motion or just the word sleeping. So that's the repetition of words. At this age, of course, particularly age two, children are really into learning animal sounds. And it's a lot of fun for them. They enjoy it. So, of course, we want to use some of these books that uh, encourage animal sounds, like Denise Fleming's Barnyard Banter. You can actually um, sing this one. But you have to add a couple words. I'll, I'll show how I always did this one. Cows in the pasture, moo, moo, moo. Roosters in the barnyard, cock-a-doodle-doo. Hens in the hen house, cluck, cluck, cluck. Pigs in the walla, muck, muck, muck. And then I would use the spoken word, spoken words. But where's goose? And that repeats a lot. That phrase does, but also the sounds the animals make. 
In fact, there's a double page spread in the back where you have all these animal sounds where the children can actually join in. Also for talking, having children identifying body parts or common objects while you're sharing a book. A book that comes to mind here is the book uh, written by Bill Martin called Here Are My Hands. Here are my hands for catching and throwing. Here are my feet for stopping and going. Here is my head for thinking and knowing. And here is my nose for smelling and blowing. So in this particular book, to get them to participate, you could actually say, here are my, and hold up hands and say, what's this? That's right, my hands for catching and throwing. Here are my, and then point to your feet, point to your head, etc. We can also use books with sound effects and have children join in. Perfect example for this, that'd be good for this age, is called Chugga Chugga Choo Choo. This old classic, Chugga Chugga Choo Choo Whistle. Let me do that again. <laughs> chugga Chugga Choo Choo Whistle Blowing. Woo! Hurry, hurry, load the freight to the city, can't be late. Through the country, on the loose, engine black and red caboose. Chugga, chugga, choo, choo. And kids love joining in those words. And you can make your arms go around like the wheels in the train. Chugga, chugga, choo, choo. Wheels are turning. Or they can help with the woo, woo, where you hold up your hand and pretend you're pulling the uh, the whistle to blow. So nice sound effects that they can help with there. Also for talking, you can demonstrate the first step of dialogical reading. Interesting words there. Dialogical reading, um, I see the sounds cutting out occasionally. Pam, I don't know. We'll see if anyone else responds. Um, maybe I'm moving too much. I will try to stay more steady in case it is me. Dialogical reading is, is a terminology that was actually presented in the first edition of the Every Child Ready to Read uh, manual. And there's different stages of it. Now, the first stage would be for the um, younger children, the twos and threes. It would be very simplistic. Dialogical reading is when you get the, the children, you're reading a book, but they get to dialogue or join in talking. We're back to talking again. So the first step of dialogical reading is something like, what animal is this? Maybe you're reading uh, Jump, Frog, Jump. What animal is this? That's right, it's a frog. What color is the frog? That's right, he's green. So that's the first step of dialogical reading. When kids get a little bit older, this would be the fours and fives, and I'll probably mention this again in that workshop in November, but you'll all forget it by then probably. <laughs> but anyhow, with the older kids, um, then dialogical reading, we're looking at them uh, developing predictive skills. And in that case, it'd be something like, what do you think is going to happen next? Or you show the cover of a book and say, what do you think this book is about? All right, so we're going to demo the first step of dialogical reading here. And that would be a book like Freight Train. So let's say I read the book Freight Train the whole way through. Now I open up the book to where the cars are displayed in the double page spreads. And I say, this was the caboose that's at the back. What color is he? What color is the caboose? Or what color is it, I should say? Here's the tank car next. What color is it? And here's the hopper car. Can you tell me what color that is? So again, I read the story through, but then I just open up the book later and point to the pages. Maybe you have them marked with a little post flag. Uh, and you point to those and say, ask some of the kids what the colors are. That's the first step of what we call dialogical reading, which is helpful for talking. Now, we use finger plays and songs and story times naturally. But what we want to do is really encourage families to continue those at home. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can, um, even if you have a theme story time, maybe you still do some finger plays from the week before, some standard finger plays or standard songs, uh, and use them so that, you know, parents, if they're practicing at home with their kids, you know, that the kids will get to know them, they'll get to enjoy doing them. So 
uh, that's what I would do, really encourage them. I used to, when I had a theme story times, what I did sometimes was whatever the theme was one week, at the beginning of that next week's story time, we, before we started the new theme, I'd say, okay, let's do a couple of our finger plays, or let's do a song from last week. And that's how we started our story time, with a little bit of repetition. Because I gave them a take-home sheet. It was kind of like, I didn't want to call it that, but it was kind of like homework. <laughs> but, you know, we want to encourage them to do this at home, um, because this is going to help with these young children's early literacy experiences. So anything you can do to uh, convince parents or early childhood people to, to continue these experiences is going to be a good thing. Now, also for talking, I gr granted this will not necessarily work so much on a story time, but for one-on-one -on -one sharing, you can uh, tell parents this, wordless books, and a lot of times parents will avoid wordless books, and wordless books are excellent. You can tell the story first by that. I mean, you go through and tell the story that you see in the pictures and then have them do it. When my grandchild was two years old, uh, I took, he, actually, what he wanted was he wanted a book uh, on robots. Now, he's in fourth grade now, so I know there have been a lot of robot books come out in the last couple years, but I want to tell you, when he was two years old, it was really, really difficult to find robot books on his level. So I want to show you what I gave him, but this is, I want to talk about this one first. Pat Shores, who does the books about the dog Biscuit, the I Can Read books, has this nice little series of books about Jack the dog. I like Jack and the Missing Piece because it has alphabet blocks in it, which is wonderful because kids that are seeing the letters of the alphabet. Again, these are wordless books that are good for two and three year olds. It's hard to find wordless books that are good for two and three year olds. If you think of the David Wiesner books or some of those, they're for much older children. Okay, here's the one that I gave gave my two-year-old grandson when he wanted something on robots, and I couldn't find a dang thing on robots for him. This book, I, I don't have the inside of it. I don't want to get involved in copyright, but inside, it's actually the, these little, they say night visitors come to visit Jack the dog, and I'm sure they're supposed to be like aliens from some other planet, <laughs> but they look exactly like little robots, and he was so thrilled with this book. So when I uh, they live in the Chicago area. And when I took and gave it to him, I went through and like kind of told the story. And he kept looking at me because already at age two, he understood print. He was he understood print concepts already. And I think he was like staring at me thinking, where is she getting this from? Or how, you know, what is she doing? There's no words there. He understood that already at age two. But then he thought that was fun. And so then he says, let me do it. Let me do it. And his parents told me that he, for like the next week, he wanted to do that every night before he went to bed. But he told the story different each time with different embellishments. And I think that is really, fan when I thought about it, I thought that's really fantastic. <laughs> so wordless books, you know, again, a lot of times parents maybe don't want to use them. I've seen people, you know, where kids are picking out books in the library and the parent looks at it and says, oh, that, that book doesn't have any words in it. We don't want that. So they throw it down. <laughs> so we want to encourage them to use the wordless books. Let's move on to singing, talking, singing. Okay, first, just some general tips for using music with children ages two and three. We wanna keep the song short and within their voice range. Children at this voice, at this age, their voice range usually only goes one octave at the most. So we're talking about C, D, E, F, G, a, B, C, that's about all the higher they can go. They might be able to do a D above that or a B below that middle C, but really that's that's a big range for young kids. So we want to keep songs not only short, I mean long songs obviously, tension span at this age, but also within their voice range. And we are going to use less verses. For instance, if I, than I would with preschool, if I were doing the wheels of the bus, I would only use three verses at the most four rather than the 100 there are, 100 verses there are in the real version. Not really, but you know, there's a lot, a lot of verses in the real version. So I would just use, you know, a couple verses. Uh, that's not enough for these ages. We want to use familiar songs and repeat them. Again, we know why that is. That's good for brain synapses. It's good for them to um, remember the words, learn words, etc. Sing songs a little slower. Now, I know I mentioned this in the baby, but I'm going to mention it again. You know, a lot of CDs, 
the people sing entirely too fast. And uh, that's why sometimes for the younger, particularly for babies, I will use some recordings, but you know, I really recommend that you do a lot of live voice singing. I would continue that with the twos and threes. Again, you can use some recordings, but I'd use some live voice and sing it just a little bit slower. I think the song I demoed with the baby one was the it see bit see spider. So just a tad slower. We also want to emphasize those syllables spider because that helps them with phonological skills. It helps them, you know, if you remember, if you attended that webinar or listened to it, um, in songs, there is a different music note for every single syllable. So when we sing songs, that's breaking words apart in syllables. That helps them with phonological awareness. Phonological awareness is necessity to learn to read. So that's why we want to sing these songs a little slower, emphasize the syllables. Include movement or motions. Uh, again, simpler motions than you would do with preschool children. I will remind you again, I, again, I think I said this before, two-year-old children particularly, threes might be able to start doing it, but they're not even going to be that great at it yet. Two-year-olds cannot put one finger down at a time and hold it down. For instance, if you have like uh, five little monkeys jump in the bed, they can't put one down, two down, three. They don't have the, the small motor skills yet that let them do that. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do that song. They might not just be able to do the finger part that we're used to by putting the fingers down one by one. So, you know, we want to have simple motions that they can actually do. With twos and threes, it's good to have whole hand motions or open and closing hands or whole, you know, like I said, whole motions. Echo songs are also great for these young children uh, where you sing a, something and they echo after you. Um, trying to think of a song right now. The only one that's coming to mind is one I probably use more often with preschool. Uh, but Greg and Steve have an echo song that goes A, B, C, and the kids go A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, D, E, F, and G, H, I, J, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, K, L, M, N, O, P. So something like that, any kind of echo song. Let's talk about um, what music activities are developmentally appropriate, uh, better known as DAP in the early childhood world, developmentally appropriate music activities for kids this age. We want simple musical instruments that are easy to play. That'd be something like shakers, maracas, egg shakers, um, drums, any of these simplistic instruments. Um, moving to music. Now, I want to point out why this is important. Why do we want kids to stand up and move to music. What's the benefit for them? I know a lot of you have probably heard about this, but I'm just for the few who might not, I'm going to talk about it. When we're moving to music and we're moving our hands in a certain way, if we are crossing the bo body midline, if you can imagine a line going down the center of your body, and you're moving your arms and legs and crossing over to the other side one way or the other, switching hands, arms, whatever, crossing that body midline is an important developmental skill. Kids need opportunities to do this because crossing the midline helps with such things as writing, reaching towards your foot to put on your shoe and sock, um, even hitting a ball with a bat. So if your child, if a child spontaneously crosses the midline with a dominant hand, then that dominant hand is going to get all the practice it needs. It's going to help that dominant hand develop good, fine motor skills. If a child doesn't get enough opportunities to cross the midline, then both hands are getting equal practice at developing skill, and their true right hand or left hand is not developed. That's going to be delayed. Once the child starts to school, learning to write is going to be much more difficult. So, you know, crossing the midline is very, very, very important. And so moving to music is really going to help with that. Let's talk about other music activities that are good for twos and threes. Uh, streamers, the parachute, uh, bean bags, egg shakers. I'd always get really bright colored ones, uh, the bean bags. You can order some that are very bright primary colors. Same with the egg shakers and lummy sticks. 
I think every library should have Lummy sticks. These are Lummy sticks if you've never had them before. Again, you can buy them. They could be blank, plain colored. I always like to get the, the colored ones. Kids are attracted to bright colors, and there's all kinds of CDs and little activities that you can do with uh, Lummy sticks. That would be good for crossing the midline, too. All right, so singing, we also want to talk about sharing song picture books. There's tons of them out there. Here's a couple that I think are good for the twos and threes. We got The Babies on the Bus um, by Karen Katz, which shows a lot of babies. There are the traditional verses, but there are some other verses to make it more like a story. The babies on the bus fall fast asleep, fast asleep, fast asleep. And then the motor on the bus goes zoom, 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 zoom. The driver in the bus says, everyone up, everyone up. So there's a couple of different um, verses. Um, the kids are actually going off uh, to a, a museum, which, I don't know, babies going to a museum and they're all walking. So I'm not quite sure about that. But anyhow, it's, you know, the bright color pictures. Uh, are really good for young kids. That peek the cat, if you want to do that. That's a little bit long for twos and threes, though. I, I would probably pin a couple pages together and just do some of the verses there. Okay, singing, singing songs about body parts. The obvious one is uh, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, of course. Now, again, I do that a little bit slower for twos and threes. You, you know, it's fun with the preschoolers to do it one way, and they say, let's do it fast, you know, and they love it. They're laughing, trying to keep up with you. They think it's fun. Okay, with the twos and threes, we probably have to do it a little bit slower because they have to take some longer to think about what body part it is. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And then if you want to make it a little interesting, you can add some other, like maybe add one other verse, do it a little bit slow too. And maybe this time we start at the bottom instead of the, the top, like feet, tummies, elbows, chins, elbows, chins, or hands. You could use hands too. Feet, tummies, hands, and chins hands and chins and so you can you know you can even adjust the words a little bit they're getting to learn some different body parts and being able to say them uh sing songs where children need to fill in a rhyming word or join in on a repeated phrase just like talking now we're going to sing songs that way uh five little monkeys now again they can't put those fingers down one by one but they can shake their finger maybe at the end no more monkeys jumping on the bed and I always like to do in every story time, this is just a little sidelight. It doesn't really have anything to do with every child ready to read, but um, I teach at Kent State University, mass, students getting their master's degrees. And one of the things I tell them to do in their story time for twos and threes and fours and fives, I tell them always to have one participate, do their longest story first. The, the attention span's the, the best. Then I do a participation story second so they can participate in some way, whether it be words, motions, whatever, some kind of participation. And if I could, I couldn't always do this, but I all, if I could, I'd like to do a visual story for my third story. I just think it helps kids. You know, we all have different ways of learning. Some of us are visual learners or whatever. I like to do one visual um, and they, they, they could see it and really see it well and help tell it or whatever. Okay, singing uh, using nonsense rhymes and songs. For instance, the song uh, Little Flea. I don't know if you know this or not. Cre and this is good for body parts too. It's good for a lot of things, but it's, it's good for this age. Creeping, creeping, little flea, up my leg and past my knee, to my tummy, on he goes, past my chin and to my nose. Now he's creeping down my chin to my tummy once again down my leg and past my knee to my to toe that little flea gotcha that always scares them when you do that gotcha part <laughs> so don't do it too ferocious for twos and threes okay it's kind of a little nonsense song but it's something that they can participate and again they're learning some kind of neat words there too if they don't already know them Okay, singing, uh, we're going to demonstrate the song first, then do the motions and have them join in. I directed a children's choir. It was preschool kids up through third grade for something like 13 or 14 years. And I found for kids to learn songs, it really helped to give some simple motions. They can remember the words so much better. So maybe we demo that song first and the motions and then have them join in later. Share songs that tell a story like the itsy bitsy spider. Again, they can't do that complicated with the thumb and the second finger, 
but they could just creep their fingers up like the spiders climbing up or down. I had to show you this because I saw this online and I thought it was so cute, particularly for twos and threes because they can't do that more complicated version. I just thought this was adorable where they have little holes that they can put their fingers through. That would not be that hard to make with a paper plate, wiggly eyes, and um, pipe cleaners or chenille, chenille stems, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it'd be pretty easy to make. I thought that'd be a really fun thing to do. Or you could have it, you know, on demo with it. Uh, make sure you repeat those favorite songs again. That's helping them learn the words. It's, you know, it's helping with brain synapses. Okay, let's move on to um, reading. Will you share the lyrics to that little flea song? You know, it's online, Bethany. Um, I think it's just called Little Flea. But if you have trouble finding it, just email me. I'll give it to you. But I'm pretty sure you can. I'm pretty sure you can Google it. Um, I know one of the recordings it's on is the We Sing people. You know, the We Sing. Um, there's so many We Sings. I know they have recorded it. I'm not sure who else has recorded it. But I'm pretty sure, Bethany, that the words are online. I think it's just called Flea Song or Little Flea Song, something like that. I know it is really cute. I agree. Okay, let's move on to um, reading. And we're going to talk about um, what's good for reading here. Okay. Thank you. I did just find... Oh, she put the whole... Oh, somebody else put the... Put a whole... <laughs> Thank you. I just found that we sing I did just find that we sing one just wasn't sure that was it yes it is and um, someone else has given you a, a real long search <laughs> thing there oh Pierce County Library Systems yeah you know I tell you where else um, if you have I don't know what made me think of this right now but thanks for asking the question Bethany because um, this is another oh this is a wonderful resource I show my students at Kent State all the time if you have not seen this and I can't I can't tell you the website offhand, but uh, Karen, <laughs> just like last webinar, I forgot to <laughs> I forgot to type all this stuff up ahead of time, like the names of the books and the titles. So let me write myself a note right now to give you also the King. I'm gonna write this down so I don't forget the King County Library System to get you the. I'm sure you might be able to find it, but King County Library System has taped. Oh, I bet there's. I bet there's. There might even be a. I'm not exaggerating. I'm sure there's over a thousand, if not even more than that, um, songs and finger plays, and they show you how to do them. I think they kind of did it for parents, but I think it's also a great resource for librarians. I always direct my students to it, and I'm I'm almost positive that, yep, there someone has it. Linda, <laughs> Linda has it already. <laughs> uh, KCLS.org content creeping creeping little flea. But they have tons, thank you, Linda. They have tons of rhymes and songs. Look at that resource sometime. I don't think any library system has as many um, things recorded. There are other sites. I'll try to put that in a newsletter in the future. That'd be good for a newsletter too. I have, I have wonderful sites for my students of um, finger plays and songs. And um, well, I'll, I'll, that's, that's good subject matter for a newsletter. Okay, let's go on to sharing books with twos and threes. Uh, with those twos, we're going to start with the board books until they can start handling paper pages. Of course, if a kid's been read to forever, they're going to be doing the paper pages maybe before two. But I'm just saying in general, board books until they start knowing how to handle paper page books. We want books with bright colors, subjects familiar to the child's world, such as families, animals, uh, typical activities like dressing or feeding oneself, uh, basic concepts such as colors, ABCs, counting, except... I stop to say not to drill them, not to force them to learn the colors they be, well, you know, to force them to learn this stuff. You're, you're simply exposing them to it. If a child hears uh, a favorite alphabet book over and over, of course they're going to start learning the ABCs, but I don't think any of that should be forced. Uh, this is something that my students always miss in the Kent class. They're always picking books that for the twos and threes that are really more appropriate for preschoolers. If we're looking for books for twos and threes, we want books that only have one or two sentences, maybe three sentences per page. Uh, they just get too lengthy. Now, I know some kids, of course, are going to listen to like the longest Dr. Seuss book in the world when they're at age two. But when you're doing a story time program, you have to think of the average child that's attending your story time. So we're looking at books that contain only a couple sentences per page. Um, okay, well, we talked about having them participate. 
Uh, share books that allow for sensory experiences such as flaps. I talked about that last week, how you can reinforce those flaps first with some tape. Uh, books that have surfaces to touch, peekaboo, pop-ups, whatever. Pick books depicting children from different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, continue to share nursery rhymes and song books. That's important for language development and phonological awareness. Here's some tips for the parents. Let the child help turn the pages. Let the child help select books. Uh, read short books several times a day because of their limited attention span. They might only want to listen so long. And then pick books you like. <laughs> Invent enthusiasm, not only for parents, but also for us. I, I can't believe when I had it used to observe students doing um, story times, I'd say, why did you pick that book? Well, I needed another book on the theme of Valentine's Day, and that's the only book I could find. I said, that's for a lot older kids. Well, yeah, but that's the only thing I could find. And they weren't enthusiastic when they shared it, and it showed. And midway through the book, the kids were just moving around and jumping and going every which way. I mean, they were to she, she had totally lost the students. Okay, maybe there weren't a lot of books in Valentine's Day, but she could have picked a book on friendship or something else that, you know, would have been far better than getting so worried about the theme that it's not a book that you don't like and you're not enthusiastic about. I'm sure you've seen other people present. I've seen people do things in story times. They'll hold up a book and I think, ooh, they're not going to share that, are they? And all of a sudden they share it in a way that I, I think, wow. You know, so we all like different things, but whatever we share, you know, make sure that enthusiasm shows. Okay, we want to pick developmentally appropriate books. And I have to show you this little cartoon because I think this is so cute. He's only two. Don't you think you might be pushing it just a little bit? Not if he wants to go to the right college. Besides, it's a board book. <laughs> and of course, the book is The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. And he's going to preschool. This is really telling, the haves and have-nots. And if you look closely under The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, you see the little boy, Mama, Mama. <laughs> okay, so some books, not so developmentally appropriate for twos and threes. Okay, what are some books we do want to pick? We want to pick predictable stories, stories that are interactive, animals, again, big at this, these ages, transportation and vehicles, real big at these ages, and books with simple concepts, not to drill them or force learning, but just for exposure. Naming body parts, books about friendship. They're just starting to understand friendship at this age and sharing and all that wonderful stuff. Families, books about families. Emotions, they're starting to understand anger and hurt feelings, etc. And song picture books. Let's start out with the predictable books. Predictable books are books that are going to repeat words or phrases or sentences. Just like talking, it's the same thing for reading. We want these predictable books like Dear Zoo. I wrote to the zoo to send me a pet. They sent me a elephant. He was too big. I sent him back. So the predictable part, the repeated part is always I sent him back. Um, this is, I'm going to put this in the newsletter, but this is a wonderful site for story patterns if you want to make flannel boards or whatever. It's www.kizclub.com and then story patterns and you can search different ones, but I'll try to remember to put that in the newsletter. Uh, using books that highlight sound awareness. Uh, that's good for phonological awareness, etc. The Llama Llama series is wonderful for sound awareness. Llama Llama, morning light, feeling yucky, just not right. Down to breakfast, tiny sneeze, sniffle, snuffle, tissues, please. I love the words. Let's go back to where the mo little mama has, he's sick. He gets better than mama gets sick. Mama coughs and llama yawns. How long can this day go on? Listen to this, listen to this line. Mama snortles, hacks, and wheezes. Llama llama sick of sneezes. Soggy tissues, gobs of guck. Isn't that a wonderful word, guck? Sniffing, snorting. Sneezing, yuck. I mean, wonderful words in this book for them to hear beginning sounds, etc. Just perfect for that. How about stories and rhyme? Okay, well, someone borrowed this book, from, <laughs> so I, don't have, I can't read any of it to you. But I know you know the original uh, Sheep in a Jeep, and again, wonderful uh, in rhyme. 
Sheep leap to push the jeep. Sheep shove. Sheep grunt. Sheep don't think to look up front. Jeep goes splash. Jeep goes thud. Jeep goes deep in gooey mud. All these sheep books are the same, perfect for twos and threes. Here's another Llama Llama one. These books, these Llama Llama books are just perfect for Ryan. This is Llama Llama time to share. And what I like about this book is, and why it's so perfect for these ages, is that's when they start to learn the concept of share, sharing. It's kind of hard to do at that age. And in this little um, story, Llama, uh, there's a friend that comes over and Llama doesn't want to share. But again, the rhyme is great. Nellie starts to build a town. Llama Llama starts to frown. Nellie New makes walls and stairs. Llama watches from a chair. See, he's, she's visiting and she's playing with his toys, and obviously he's not thinking too much of this. Nellie stocks, stacks the blocks up high. Uh, fuzzy Llama decides he wants to try, and then he joins in. But there's some wonderful rhyming things in these Llama Llama books. How about interactive books? I love this one. Crocopotamus. Crocopotamus. This is just a perfect book for these ages. It has sturdy flaps, and you mix and match, and you can create a variety of wild animals. It actually is depicting seven different animals, but you can interchange those fronts and blacks and come up with interesting words like libra, which is a cross between a lion and a zebra, or the one that's here in the title page, crocopotamus, which is a cross between a crocodile and a hippopotamus. But this is a perfect interactive experience for toddlers and two-year-olds and threes. Um, this might be better for one-on-one -on -one sharing, but it's just a great book for that this, with this mix, mix and match aspect. And of course, very bright eye-catching illustrations. Fortune Cookies, this was illustrated by Caldecott Medal medalist Chris Roschke. And this particular book, um, each little fortune cookie has a little fortune that kind of pulls out. And it's like a tab that like pulls out. So that's a nice uh, interactive book, and it's a simple text. Animal books, I love this I Spy series. He has tons of them. Um, I don't remember them all. I Spy, it's kind of like I Spy with my little eye. And there's oceans, and this one's the farm. Um, I Spy with my little eye, something red that begins with an R. And the sound he makes is cock-a-doodle-doo. Can you tell me who that is? So not only is it an animal book and an animal sound book, but it also has them uh, joining in. So it's um, helping with talking. Who's Hungry is another um, fun book. It's all about animals and the food they eat. Uh, the animals are responding to the question, who's hungry? And they all say, I am. And then it describes the kind of food that they like to eat. And this book actually has, it says flip the flaps. They're kind of like half fold flaps. Uh, and you see these, wonderful foods that are half consumed and uh, it's a it's a great choice for story time the very busy spider i know that a lot of times we share this with preschool but one of the reasons why i think it's good for twos and threes is because it does have those sounds the animals make and it also has a repetitious phrase now i read this book a little bit different when i do it with twos and threes um, the way the wording is in the book it goes nay nay said the horse want to go for a ride now what i do is i just flip that around i say the horse said what do you think the horse said that's right nay nay or let me turn another page here the cow said moo moo want to eat some grass so the text reads moo moo said the cow want to eat some grass i flip it the cow said so that they can actually uh, join in and make those animal sounds. They're going to love transportation vehicle books. Oh my gosh, they love them. My car. Now, this series, of course, there is my car, my bus, my bike. My favorite is still my car because um, in this particular book, it has wonderful examples. Well, I think my bike does too, but it has wonderful examples of print awareness where they have the car and the, the, there's different parts labeled, you know, like you know, this is the steering wheel, or this is the tire wheel, or whatever. Like the parts are labeled, so that's great for point of print awareness because you can kind of point to those words and they can um, help identify. Uh, boats Go is again part of a series. There's Boats Go, trains, 
Oh my gosh, there's so many in this series. Boats, trains, diggers, planes, cars, trucks, boats. I love this one because it's wonderful for sounds again. The streamliner goes woo, woo, woo. The mountain train goes trip, trap, puff, puff, trip, trap, puff, puff, trip, trap, puff, puff. I mean, it's so much fun to, to read those books. That's the train one. Again, same person that barred my other book has the boat book. I didn't realize it until the other day, and I <laughs> so I had to sub substitute some things here. Okay, race car count. Uh, not only is this a counting book, uh, but it's also a wonderful race car story. Um, again, how many books do we have in race cars? There's going to be a few now, but not that many. This goes through the numbers 1 through 10. Race car 1 honks. Look at me. He zooms in front with the turn of a key. Brightly colored cartoon style illustrations. Uh, at the end of the race, they line up, do it all over again. Um, if you're really daring, you could get some little race cars and have uh, big aluminum foil um, like cake pans, have some paint in there. The kids, you know, put the race car, they kind of rub it in the paint and then a white paper that can make the tracks. That's always a fun thing to do. Um, maybe you'd rather hold that off for preschool, but it is a fun thing to do with that book. Uh, you could use that book with preschoolers too. Okay, Super Truck was an ALA notable book. Uh, we got the, the very unassuming garbage truck. Um, all the other trucks are all like heroes. We got the, uh, the trucks that are rescuing broken down buses and cars. We got the trucks that are fighting fires and helping to save the day. And there's the little garbage truck. Well, one night the snow is piling up, piling up, piling up. And the, <laughs> the garbage truck is now bespeckled. <laughs> and he transforms into a super truck and plows all the snow. Um, and so, of course, they're relating to the Superman when he puts, you know, his, with his spectacles, etc. Okay, so that's a fun book on transportation and vehicle. Now, again, simple concepts, just introduce kids to colors, numbers, uh, whatever shapes, uh, not to force them to learn it. Uh, Denise Fleming, shout, shout it out, is good. This is, uh, everybody loves to shout. So if you know it, shout it out. Ready, set, go. And it goes through numbers 1 to 10. It goes through the alphabet, colors, names of animals, and also modes of transportation. Edible numbers. What I like about this book, it's also a counting book from 1 to 12, and it shows different fruits and vegetables. But what's interesting about it is, and distinguishes it from some other counting books, is that it shows like apples. It will show the standard red apple, but it will also show you Golden Delicious and Granny Smith and Pink Ladies and Golden Russets. Or it'll show you a, a pepper. A lot of times we think of a green pepper. Peppers are green, but there's also peppers that are brown, or there's peppers that are purple. So it's it's really a good book to learn uh, different types of vegetables and fruits. One Blue Fish is a colorful counting book, as it states. This has a page that kind of flips out. Say for the number three, you actually lift up, so it's interactive also. You lift up the number three, and we see three green fogs and they can help count them or they can identify the color or whatever. Naming body parts. I'm sorry. Here's this one again. I, I redid this PowerPoint, I swear, 20 times and I didn't realize I had the same book twice in there twice or I wouldn't have used it. So let's do another one. I love you nose. I love you toes. One of the things I like about this book, it shows different genders and different ethnicities, but it does talk about body parts. For instance, hair. Some children have straight hair, curly hair, brown hair, red hair, long hair, short hair. And then the, the hair is all different colors, too. And then it moves on to body parts. I love you eyebrows, eyeballs, too. I love to show nice things to you. And then it goes on to safety. Be careful, body. Whoa, beep, beep. Make sure to look before you leap. Body, you're the one for me. If not for you, where would I be? So it's really good for um, identifying body parts. Books about friendship because kids at this age are just beginning to understand the whole concept of friendship. Here's the Bear and Mole series. I love this series. Another reason why it's good for these ages, there's only like two sentences in each page. I mean, it's not a really long text. In this one, um, Mole is actually taking his training wheels off for the first time, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's a real episode there. I love this new book about blocks because it really talks about sharing. And I know a lot of libraries, you know, after um, a story time, they'll bring blocks out. So it kind of fits uh, 
fits that idea well, but it they're playing with their own individual blocks, and then all of a sudden it's like they one starts taking the other one's blocks, and we get into this whole concept of sharing. Families, uh, how can you not do well with Todd Parr's books? This is the family book uh, done in bright colors, shows all different kinds of families. Uh, stepmom, stepdad, stepsister, stepbrothers, uh, families that have two moms or two dads, uh, children that only have one parent. Um, then it goes, it, has, it starts with differences, but then, then it goes into similarities. All, you know, we like to hug each other. Uh, we're sad when we lose someone we love. We enjoy celebrating special days together. Good for young children because of the bright colors and the, 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 care, the, you know, the drawing of the children. I Love My Dad, and again, a very simplistic book. There's I Love My Dad, and there's one called I Love My Mom. <laughs> my name is Ollie. I love my dad. We make banana bread. Yum, yum. Hot cocoa for everyone. So again, a simple text, uh, but a nice little series for, about families. Emotions. Don't you love a good day? That's, uh, by the way, it's in a board book and a regular book. I When I, this book first came out, I thought, Oh, that's interesting because it's called a good day, and the first sentence is, "It was a bad day," <laughs> and it talks about how the little bird loses his tail feather and his dog is all tangled and all these horrible little things, and then everybody's luck turns around and it turns into a good day. I must have Bobo is excellent also for emotions and feelings. Um, the boy keeps losing his. Um, Bobo, and he freaks out every time because he's attached to it, just like a kid be attached to their little security blanket or whatever they're attached to. Uh, it turns out the cat, or all the cats taking it. <laughs> so again, this is the type of experience that kids at this age will really be able to relate to. Song picture books. Now I know everyone uses this for preschool. This first one, I really, I really think it's great for twos and threes too because it's just simple for colors it doesn't have a whole lot of text and how can we all not love uh pete the cat who's walking down the street in his brand new white shoes loved his white shoes so much he began to sing this song i love my white shoes if you're hoppy and you know this is one that you can when i first got it, i thought how am i going to do this because i don't know if i can sing it but i figured out a way because you have to read part of it, too. If you're hoppy and you know it, you're a frog. If you're hoppy and you know it, you're a frog. Or a bunny. If you're hoppy and you know it, stretch your toes to really show it. If you're hoppy and you know it, you're a frog. Or a bunny. Or a cricket. So some lines you have to kind of read. You can't sing it the whole way through. Or, well, maybe you can. I've not figured out a way to do it. Okay, last thing on reading you need to encourage families to read at home. You know, that's that's why we do story times. Enough said in that. I know you know that. Okay, let's get into writing because I'm getting kind of short of time here. Writing, um, what we, at this, at this age, when kids are first starting to read any kind of print, the first print they're going to read is environmental print. And I know a lot of people think of McDonald's, but whatever it is, Target, the stop sign, Lego, they start recognizing those words that are out in their environment that they see over and over and over again. So one of the things we can do in our settings are, you know, label some things, you know, so that they can see the print and they can see the words. You can do that in your library to help with that. Um, the other thing we can do with writing is we can occasionally um, point to repeated words in a text. For instance, uh, our classic brown bear, brown bear, maybe you just report, you point to the word bear, brown bear, brown bear. So that when pointing occasionally, not every word, they start to understand those squiggles or lines mean something. Here's a book I shared often in story time called Dancing Feet. The funny thing about this book is, even though the book is called Dancing Feet, the repetitious words are happy feet. It's not Dancing Feet in the book. So it goes, Tippity, tippity, little black feet. Who is dancing that tippity beat? Ladybugs are dancing on tippity feet. Tippity, tippity, happy feet. So what did I do to help them start to recognize print? Yep, that's what I did. I made that wonderful. It's a size. It's exactly the size of a yellow piece of, um, oh, what do you call that stuff? 
stock uh, paper. I can't think what you call it. Someone can type quick. Maybe they can help me. Um, anyhow, the paper that you buy in stores, it's like a buck a piece or whatever. You can get it at a dollar store. Uh, and I cut out the foot, and I actually used, um, no, not construction paper, the, 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 the sturdy board paper. <laughs> I know it has a word, and I can't think of it right now. <sighs> anyhow, I painted the poster board. Yeah, I guess it's cardstock. Well, it could be, I think it's poster board. It's poster board because it's, it's big, and that way kids can see it. It's probably like bigger than, probably about 15 or 16 inches tall and so many inches wide. Anyhow, I made the foot, and I, I actually used my fingernail polish to paint the toenails, and I put the words happy feet, and the, the words repeat constantly in the story, the happy feet. And so when I got to that part, I pointed to the words. Not only could they join in, but they, you know, they start to recognize what those words were, which I think is neat. Also for writing, we want to, you know, think about ways to expose kids to letters, like the alphabet letters. I would definitely have them in my in one of my tables in my library, a good set of alphabet letters. Sandpaper letters where they can feel it. Magnetic letters. You can trace a letter in the palm of a hand. A parent could do that. Kids could trace in a tray of sand or shaving cream. Whenever I shared any alphabet book, any alphabet book, I would have my magnetic board there with the letters of the alphabet, and if I was um, reading an alphabet story, A told B, and B told C, whatever it is, I would be pointing to them so that they could see. So I would, um, I might have the, I think I have usually use the capitals first. Okay, also for writing uh, chubby crayons, so these are the thicker crayons. Again, they're, they're still learning to grasp and do all that fine motor stuff, so I'd use the chubby crayons, Play-Doh, any of this kind of stuff that will help with the small motor skills is going to help them with writing later. Tracing around stencils or cookie cutters. Ribbon sticks. Now, again, when they are moving those ribbon sticks, that's definitive crossing the midline. Definitive crossing the midline. And as I said, crossing the midline, later you learn how to write. And I have made that one in the right. I used a um, court size ring you know if you can i canned peaches last week by the way <laughs> but in canning you know those quart size rings and i got ribbon at hobby lobby or someplace and tied them on and the kids could hold on to the ring and you know if you can't afford to you know, buy real honest goodness ribbon sticks that's a, a neat thing to do uh sidewalk chalk stacking blocks that's also helping with fine motor picking up toys using their any of that is going to help with writing later uh, you can draw a picture of a story. Um, they could do it after story time. Like, you know, you have paper down, big long paper going, you know, a good length of the room and have it, you know, fastened to the floor with masking tape or whatever. And they can draw or color on it. You know, great thing to do at the end of a story time. Okay, plain. I'm going to have to go through this a little bit quickly, but it's not as long, so it's okay. What we want to do for playing, I would have them act out stories. Now, here's a very simplistic version, very simplistic version of The Three Bears by Brian Barton, only like a line or two per page. I have had, I cannot tell you the number of times in story time when I had the twos and the threes get up and act out this story. And all we did was we were always Goldilocks, and we didn't move very far from our place. You know, we first we looked through the window, so we put our hand up over our eyes, looked through the window, we opened the door. We came in, we tried, you know, we tried the porridge, all three bowls, tried the chair, and I just kind of like moved back and forth like I was sitting in a chair. In the bed, I just put my head on my uh, my hands like I was sleeping, and the bears come home, and we jumped out the window. So that's a very easy story to act out. Acting out songs, we already talked about this, but Five Little Monkeys, again, you know, maybe just have them jump up and down. Do you know how much two- and three-year-olds just love jumping up and down? They just love jump up and down. Maybe that's all they have to do for that one. Uh, row, row, row your boat is one where they could, this is a, a book by Jane Cabrera where she has extra verses. Again, all they have to do is stand there and do the rowing motions, and that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, rhyme games or puzzles. This is something else I had sitting on my library tables. These are by Melissa and Doug. They're toys, and if you look closely, they're little puzzles. They're great for rhyming words. So the only pieces that match are the ones that are actually words that rhyme. So hen and pen, that's the only way that piece would match, or cat and hat, 
or boat and coat. I also had another set that had letters of the alphabet and it had one piece would have the capital letter and the lowercase letter like D uppercase D lowercase and the only thing it fit on in that puzzle was the picture of the dog and you can still purchase this and listen dog they're wonderful um, things to have playing the I spy game which I think everybody knows how to do that I spy something in this room that begins with the letter B or the letter C or whatever and my last slide here in play is uh, there's a lot of different play activities we can do um, during story time or at the end of story time that's great again having those chubby crayons markers chalk play-doh again it's going to help with writing later you know we think oh they're just playing with play-doh no it actually has a wonderful purpose uh, pretend play and of course block play i'm sure some of you do that already for these kids i mean you can use legos but if you have the duplos or something that's a little bit bigger that's a little bit easier for them to manipulate uh, and i'm sure you can think of some other play activities well, we're kind of right up against the clock, and I apologize. I didn't know I was going so long. <laughs> so I, are there any questions or comments or anything you want to share real quickly? I think we have like another minute or so. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I hope you'll join again for the the preschool one. Uh, we will do that the same way. I'll go through. I'll try to make sure it's not quite as many slide pictures. <laughs> and thank you very much. Um, thank you, Karen. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute my headset. Uh, if uh, anyone else has a question, please feel free to, to put it in the comment box. Um, otherwise, we will go ahead and get the webinar recording posted. Feel free to share with other staff uh, and anyone that you're working with with early literacy story times. And thank you so much for your time this afternoon, Sue. Thank you. I enjoy doing these. I'll try to make my next one a little shorter. <laughs> Thank you, though. Alrighty. It doesn't look like we're getting any questions, so I'll go ahead and stop the recording.